I think I kind of just got into my sleeping bag and like maybe about five minutes after that, a car drove past and then the car stopped and reversed back. And I was like lying there being like, oh my goodness, oh my goodness, oh my goodness. For everyone listening, why don't you tell us about yourself? Uh, sure. Uh, so I'm Emily Scott. Uh, I am currently residing in Edinburgh, um, but I grew up in Northern Ireland. Um, and then I... Emily, how did you get into adventuring? Uh, I guess, well, so I grew up in the countryside in Northern Ireland. So kind of the outdoors has always been quite important um but I wouldn't have necessarily called myself outdoorsy per se um but then after I graduated from uni I moved down to London and I worked as a chartered accountant and I think when I was kind of office based in London I kind of started searching for more and more of uh I think it kind of was more like uh challenges to start with so kind of like I started doing triathlons and things and then the triathlons gradually got longer and then it slightly became more like oh I don't know if I actually need a a race to do or if I just go and think up something to to go out and do instead um yeah so I think I think that was probably part of it kind of getting into kind of yeah physical challenges um and then um I decided to leave accountancy to pursue a career in ski instructing um although now I'm kind of slightly trying to amalgamate the two a bit more and I'm finding myself doing much more accountancy right now and uh ski instructing looks slightly off the cards this winter but um yeah it's uh so I guess yeah just kind of doing like I guess tying in the kind of challenges side that I'd probably been building up over the kind of 20 I don't know 2010 to 2015 say um and then kind of doing more in the mountains with like ski instructing and um just and then kind of just I guess amalgamating the two and being like well I quite like pushing myself physically and now I feel more confident in doing that out with of a like com- like set structure competition kind of thing so then I kind of started yeah thinking a bit more about doing my own adventures and things and yeah I guess so it just kind of is a bit of a progression from there and I mean I still it's funny because actually now I slightly find I'm still like wanting a bit more kind of racing and a bit more structure back again whereas I think I had a few years that I kind of completely went away from that and now I'm actually would quite like a bit of that but also I really enjoy a bit of kind of my own adventures and I find now that they don't Sometimes I like them to be really tough, but other times I actually like them to be enjoyable. Um, so I guess it's just, yeah. What was the what was the trigger that sort of made you decide, right, accountancy out, um, adventures and skiing was in? Was there something that triggered it? I think it was quite a, uh, it was quite a long process, really. It was quite a, um, yeah, it... Uh, I guess essentially like I wasn't I always I just always feel a bit lame talking about this because I'm like oh I don't think I was that happy which just kind of yeah I think you know that was kind of the like the like underlying feeling though was like I wasn't like particularly satisfied I guess and um so it was kind of you know I was like especially going through the Chartered Council qualifications you know there's a lot of a lot of studying involved and things and so I'd basically be at the like especially when I was around exam time I'd be in the office and then I'd go home and I'd sit at my desk and I'd carry on or at my kitchen table as it was and I'd carry on and you know keep studying and um and I think then I kind of you know I started definitely kind of chasing the weekends quite a lot and becoming you know a bit more of a like weekend warrior and you know really trying to cram everything into my weekend and um you know I'd find like the last certainly like six months I was living in London I probably was driving to the lakes or to Snowdonia to the Breckens like kind of every other weekend and the amount of times I was sitting in on the Sunday evening coming in with all the traffic coming back into London on the M4 and I think it was one of those things that I I definitely I mean there's part of it that the amount of times that I had 
you know that scare whenever you're driving and you're really tired and you kind of feel yourself like starting to like nod off like I think I had that happen probably a few too many times that that was like something needs to stop here and I think you know I was kind of I guess burning the candle at both ends and stuff um so I guess that's kind of maybe part of it and then you know I felt like I was getting so much more fulfillment out of the days that I was spending out in the hills and you know especially if I was out with friends or whatever and like pushing myself and seeing like I think I quite like on a challenge I really enjoy this the part whenever you kind of you feel like you can't really go on anymore but then actually you just keep going and then it's like oh actually that wasn't so bad anyway and kind of just kind of stretching that like I guess it's kind of your comfort zone and like I definitely find that each time you do something that you push yourself harder then each time it's you know it's a little bit harder to push yourself harder if that makes sense um like I always kind of think of it as a bit like a balloon like you know whenever you blow it up like really wide and then you bring it back in it's never quite goes back to quite as small as it was the first time and I think your kind of comfort zone's a bit like that as well in the sense it goes like a bit wider each time um and yeah I guess so there was definitely an element of just trying to like uh see like you know what what I could kind of push myself to do or things like that as well um this is the least succinct answer ever um <laughs> but yeah I don't know I think I mean accountancy is a funny one because I think a lot of people find it really odd that I'm an accountant and you know I think there's this kind of preconception that accountants are really dull and like spreadsheets and stuff and don't get me wrong I can be really dull and I do like spreadsheets but I mean I don't know I think there's I work in um private client tax most of the time and that's kind of you actually get like quite a sense of like your clients and stuff and you kind of um so it's quite interesting in a kind of geeky way I'm, I'm not sure I'm selling this as being interesting um <laughs> but I think what I found like the kind of the level I was at I don't really have much interaction with clients like you know I kind of would get a feel for them in the sense of I'm looking at their bank statements and seeing what they're spending money on and being like oh this person went to like Zermatt so they probably go skiing and stuff and literally that's the kind of thing that I would like do I'd be like oh that's an interesting place um but yeah I kind of wasn't having any like um actual like client interaction and whilst you know working in an office is good in the sense of you've got colleagues to talk to and stuff like I definitely felt that I perhaps didn't have as much in common with my colleagues as you know basically like on a Monday morning everyone would be like oh how was your weekend what did you get up to and I'd be like oh I was in the Lake District and I went hiking and like we camped and we like, and we bivvied out and it was great and people be like what's a bivvy and you know that kind of like they're like Emily you're crazy you do weird things at the weekends <laughs> Yeah, you sort of looked at um, the people in your office and rather than looking up to them, sort of aspiring to be them, you looked at them and thought, mm, not not really the life I, I want. Yeah, I guess there's, there's probably an element to that. I mean, obviously, you know, there's kind of, there'd be certain parts that I would, uh, you know, aspire to be like and, you know, obviously like professionally and stuff, definitely look up to them and and. It's a funny one because it's definitely not to say that I didn't get on with my colleagues because, you know, in general, I actually, yeah, I tend to get on with most people. But I think maybe kind of the the aspect of actually not having that much kind of real like interaction. Like, I mean, this is one thing I absolutely love about ski teaching is that, you know, you're with your clients the whole time and you can build like a genuine rapport with them. And, you know, you're actually like having conversations and, yeah, you're trying to make them better at skiing, but you're also sitting on the chairlift and having a chat and like, you know, it's kind of and trying to help them have a nice time because they're on the holiday. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I guess that's part of it. And so what was the first big one that you, because you said you were doing sort of triathlons and Ironmans and marathons before? Yeah, yeah. So I think like the first, so I did, I remember this pretty clearly. I think it was um, New Year's Eve of like, the end of 2012 before I was going out with some friends like this is when I was still living in London I was going out with some friends that evening and before I went out I made a pretty rash decision and I went onto the Ironman website and I signed up to Ironman Wales for 2013 and I was like right that's that's my goal for next year I'm gonna do Ironman Wales and um I think because that year I'd kind of done I got up as far as like half Ironman distance um but I was like right I'm gonna step up and do an Ironman and Ironman Wales has got a bit of a reputation as being quite tough and I was kind of like yeah that sounds good and also I mean you know it's UK based so it's kind of a bit easier to get to less travel logistics and stuff 
Um, yeah, so I guess that was kind of the main thing to kind of work towards in 2013. And then like certainly kind of once the, you know, Easter kind of came around and triathlon season started, like I was probably doing like triathlons most weekends like I was playing hockey as well so I'd like play hockey on a Saturday and then go and do a triathlon on the Sunday it seemed to be kind of what I did most weekends that year it seemed um and then kind of I did like a few like you know like 100 mile cycle sportifs and like I did a I did a 10k swim at Eton Dorney which was pretty dull I'm not gonna lie swimming round and round a lake for four hours or whatever it was it was just like oh um but I think I found kind of before the Ironman I basically had said that I wanted to do each of the elements of the Ironman like individually to know that I could do them before like going in and trying to put them all together um and actually I ended up doing another full distance race like before Wales but um not an Ironman branded but um but it was on the flat so it was okay but yeah I mean Wales Wales is a toughie um but I definitely I mean I'd, I'd love to go back and do it again to be honest it's just I haven't as yet um but yeah I think kind of after after that I kind of said that I was going to try and do like an Ironman um well I made a pact with myself that I'd do one every year until I turned 30 um so I had like I think I was what was I at the time 25 I guess so it was, it was five in five years was kind of the goal. Um, and yeah, so I ended up doing the uh, the following year I did, I tried to do Ironman Zurich and I managed to break my bike because I had a really stupid fall the day before the race as I was cycling to transition. I like went over some tram lines and didn't quite realise and it was raining and then the next thing I was on the ground and didn't think anything that like much of it. I kind of got the bike mechanics to check over my bike and stuff and then the next day swim went well bike started fine and then hit a hill changed the gear and my whole rear derailleur just sheared off and yeah I tried to get them to fix my bike and make it into like a single single gear kind of thing but it just didn't work um so yeah that wasn't great um I went back into Zurich again a couple of years ago though so it's a really nice course um I think that was actually my last one to hit the like five for 30 or whatever um, um okay and so from from doing the Ironmans, did you do the sort of five years, five Ironmans, five five years, five Ironmans? Yeah, I think I did. Oh yeah, I did one every year for, I guess twenty twenty thirteen to twenty eighteen. I did one a year, um, and kind of threw in another couple of non-branded ones which I hate Ironman's kind of like got me so brainwashed that I'm like oh it doesn't actually have the Ironman brand on it therefore it doesn't count but actually some of them are harder <laughs> um yeah I, I did one actually called Evergreen which I did last year that's in the Alps and I tried it in 2017 and missed the bike cut off like the weather was awful I was basically hypothermic um didn't have a great day, um, but I got to Chamonix eventually on the on the bike. But you know, I kind of missed the cutoff to go out on the run by about an hour, I think. Um, and uh, and they actually ended up shortening the run because of so much snow, um, which isn't really what you what you want whenever you're doing triathlon. Um, but yeah, I went and did that again last year, and like again, I was like right up against the cutoff, but just snuck in. Um, and I mean, that was no offense to Ironman, but. <laughs> so much harder like just because it was basically because it starts um so it's in Morsey in the swim um and then it goes over to Chamonix and I feel like it takes in every coal that you can find between Morsey and Chamonix it's like something like 5,000 meters of ascent on the bike over 190k and then the run is well I say run very much in inverted commas the hike um the night hike uh, goes up like from Chamonix it kind of does like one loop on one side of the valley and one loop on the other side of the valley so you've got kind of over 2,000 meters of ascent on the on the run as well so um yeah like it's it's just a very different game to Ironman really because you know Ironman's very like sleek and um you know it's just like really like a well-oiled machine and like you know they've got like everything so like I don't know it's a funny one because it's, it's awesome like don't get me wrong I like actually like really enjoy an Ironman and like the atmosphere is so good and everything but you know they totally know what they're doing and they have the whole setup and everything like works so smoothly and you know you don't really have to think that much you just have to get on with what you're doing and you know your thinking is about what you're doing and pushing yourself and stuff um whereas I think Evergreen 
just because <laughs> you necessarily go that bit slower because it's so much more up and down that you know you've probably got a bit more thinking time and maybe like more tactics and stuff and it's just like a much smaller field so um but yeah no it's uh... when did you make the jump from sort of organized ad- trip uh, organized events into your own adventures like project 282 yeah so I think um quite a key point probably for me was this was when I was still in London and it was after I'd done my first Ironman so after I'd done Wales in 2013 and one of my really good friends was living in New Zealand at the time, but he um, grew up in Wales. And basically, it's, it's funny because I like remember this so clearly. Like I remember sitting at my desk in London, and he sent me a message. He sent me a message on WhatsApp and said, "Check your Facebook." And um, he had sent this link on Facebook that was to this adventure race called Itera Wales. It was in 2014, and he was like, "I want to do this race." Basically, he was like, "We need a girl. You're the girl. How do you feel?" Kind of thing. Because um, it's yeah, like it's teams of four, and yeah, it's got to be mixed teams. Um, and actually, yeah, I mean, I basically clicked on the link and didn't really look into it that much, and was like, "Yeah, that looks fun. It's in Wales. It's got like." mountain biking and kayaking and like running and stuff like yeah sure why not so I was like yeah sign me up um and I think that was actually like a really kind of formative thing because then kind of through that like the three guys that I did it with like you know we've become like really good friends over the years and like we've done loads of things together and I guess just kind of in the like preparing for that you know we kind of that was probably when I was you know as I was saying like driving up to the lakes or driving up to Snowdonia and stuff that that was kind of a lot of that was because we were getting in like practice weekends and getting out on bikes and things like that um and I think kind of the like again I guess an adventure race you know it is yeah it's it's organized it's set up but you've got so much more like ownership over it you know like you've kind of got certain points that you've got to go to but you don't necessarily have to go to all the checkpoints like you kind of can decide because some of them you might get x number of points for going there or you might get a time deduction if you don't go there so you might decide actually it's not worth us going there for those points and we'll take this route to go there instead and I think you know you've got so much more control over your own destiny um that that probably yeah I guess maybe kind of started things to be a bit more like oh actually this is maybe like more kind of what I'm into than necessarily just like following race marker to race marker to race marker. Um, and I think it's like, it's totally different kind of the psychological side. Cause you know, if you're in a race environment, like you don't necessarily have to like worry about looking after yourself so much. Like you're just trying to like push yourself and trying to go as hard as you can. And I think that's something I probably don't go as hard as I used to go in terms of like I probably don't go as fast as I used to and I'm certainly I'm trying to get kind of a bit more back into running at the moment and I'm certainly get frustrated because I'm like oh I used to be so much quicker but you know it's kind of it is what it is whereas um you know if you're kind of in a more either an adventure race or else just like you know your own adventures that you've kind of decided oh I want to go and do this or whatever then you know you've got to be much more in control of like your own destiny and certainly um you know then it's kind of like you're the only person who can keep yourself safe especially if you're doing solo stuff so that's certainly I guess onto project 282 which is when I climbed the Scottish Munros that was kind of it was just me out there a lot of the time so you know the best way to get out of trouble is to not get into trouble in the first place and I think that was kind of like a really key thing and you know especially when you're somewhere remote or you know mountainous environments and stuff like obviously there's so many factors that are outside of your control but then there's also a lot that you can control and I think you know you've just got to like I'm never gonna be like super fast or anything over that kind of like in the mountains like because it's just like I just yeah I mean I'm not like a ridiculous athlete or anything like that and I'm not trying to get above myself or anything like that you know it's kind of like I just keep going like I'm kind of quite a plodder and I'll just kind of keep plodding on and um but you know it's I think I'm really like not making much sense (laughs) um but yeah just kind of the whole like nature of if you're if you're doing your own adventures and your own challenges and stuff then like it's up to you to keep yourself safe and you don't have the kind of whole like supported environment that you have with with a race and I think that kind of yeah that really appeals to be honest like I do really like doing that and I mean I go there'll be times I'll do something that is like a really normal route to do but I might decide oh I'm gonna do it and try and do it quicker or something and have that as like kind of my challenge and 
by the very nature of trying to do something quicker than you know you might end up being out places that people wouldn't normally be so like for example like in the Alps like some of the trails are absolutely stunning and stuff and during the day in the summer there'll be like there's loads of people around like everybody like loves going hiking in the Alps and whatever but then if you're kind of there like first thing in the morning or last thing in the evening or in the night and suddenly you've got the trails to yourself and it's like it's a totally different experience though even if you're somewhere that you know like during the day might be like you've got loads of people around um I think and so for for people listening, um, just to give an overview of Project 282, it was a four-month solo expedition? Yeah, so Project 282, um, called 282 because there's 282 Munros in Scotland. Um, so the Munros are the mountains that are over 3,000 feet, and they were listed by... Um, a guy called Sir Hugh Munro back in, I think it was like 1901 or something, who created the Munro tables. Um, and they're like, you know, it's quite a popular peak bagging um, thing to do is to go and, to go and climb the Munros. Um, and so basically Project 282 kind of came around because I decided that I'd quite, I wanted to climb them all. And then I think it was just kind of the, you know, the kind of triathlon background that we've like touched upon that I was then like, oh, you know, it'd be kind of cool to do them like and be self-powered in between them. Um, and I mean, there's there's been other people who've done different routes. So the kind of, there's actually a guy, Donnie Campbell, who just broke the record this summer and did all the Munros in 32 days, I think it was like, which just absolutely blows my mind. Like the days that he was putting in out there are just ridiculous. Like, so hard I was kind of like some of them I was like he did it took me two weeks to do that day that he did um you know it's um so I mean but the nature of the challenge is obviously quite different like he was like supported and so I think his wife was with him in a camper van and was able to like move his bike and so his challenge was definitely like a hugely hugely athletic challenge um but you know, kind of needed like the support to be able to like, so you can take a more direct route and get around them. Whereas I kind of went for a like, right, I'm just going to do this myself. So by <laughs> very nature of being on my own, just me and my bike, it meant all my routes had to come back to my bike. Um, so I definitely added on kind of, yeah, quite a bit of distance from like the fastest possible route um or the shortest possible route should I say um so yeah so I yeah cycled between the hills and um yeah climbed up them took just under four months doing it um I I think it was 2,200 kilometers on foot and 2,400 on the bike or something I should really know this off the top of my head but it was over 2,000 kilometers on both bike and foot. And it, it kind of equated to, I think on average, it was about climbing Everest from sea level each week on foot was kind of my like ascent stats roughly until like the last week, which was just like stupid and like, I don't know, like 18,000 meters or something. <laughs> oh, wow. So you were doing the four month uh, trek on your own. Uh, how did you find, or how do you find sleeping on your own in the wild um fine <laughs> um, yeah I, think- I, I i say that because I, I think for a lot of people listening this wild camping on your own i mean the first time i did it was actually in america but i remember thinking the first few times is quite sort of nerve-wracking and you're sort of wondering i mean if you're out in the middle of the scottish highlands maybe a bit different from the side of the road but in terms of the, the sort of feeling that you had from it, uh, I, I remember the first few times I was very sort of nervous, quite wondering if I was going to be told off, moved away. You, you, you do think of these sort of horror stories in your head. I mean, um, it's, it's actually funny that you mentioned the side of the road thing, because actually the one time that I was slightly less comfortable of the whole trip was quite quite early on. And I had um, I was up in the far northwest of Scotland and I had been to a pub and had like a really nice evening in the pub after I did some hills that day. And then I like set off from the pub, like probably at like midnight or something and cycled maybe another hour up the road. And I bear in mind, I had at this point, I had a trader behind me and I was cycling like slowly, like it's not, uh, I was probably averaging about 10k an hour when I had the trader on. Um, 
and I cycled a bit up the road and then eventually I just was like right this will do and like pulled into like a passing place and um, pitched my tent like literally like at the side of the road and I think I kind of just got into my sleeping bag and like maybe about five minutes after that a car drove past and then the car stopped and reversed back and I was like lying there being like oh my goodness oh my goodness oh my goodness um and then it just drove on I think it obviously I think it just saw the like reflective bits of my tent and was probably like what on earth is that and then was like oh it's some idiot camping in the lay-by basically um but that was probably the most scared I was to be honest of the whole trip um but I mean yeah the rest of the time I think I'm pretty pretty comfortable with kind of camping and stuff anyway um it's weird because now I really don't think anything of it but I've basically spent kind of three summers living in a tent now um because the summer either side of that I was working in the Alps and I was working on like a camping and hiking trip so it was staying in campsites but still like staying in a tent pretty much every night for the whole summer um but I think kind of before I did uh Project 282 I did kind of once I decided I was going to do it was probably about the the November the year before and I was up in Scotland and I decided to kind of take myself out and do a bit of a like kind of do some testing days and um actually was a really good a really good idea because I had some pretty pretty tough days in November in Scotland so then whenever I was on actual like project to it too then I was like oh yeah I mean this is tough but at least it's not snowing or whatever you know there was always kind of something else that had happened in November that was worse so um but yeah I think on that that was actually the first time I stayed in a bothy on my own and um I mean I could easily see how I could have been a bit like freaked out by it but actually I think that day I was just so glad to get to Bothy because it was like raining slash snowing it was just kind of sleety and cold and dark and it had been dark for probably about five hours before I got to the Bothy so I was mainly just like oh I'm so glad to be here um but yeah I think it was more kind of the next day I was like oh that was actually like my first night in a Bothy on my own and like um but yeah I think in a way kind of with um whilst I was doing Project 282 generally I was so tired by the time I got into my tent or got into the bothy or whatever like by the time I got to bed I didn't really care where I was I just wanted to go to sleep so um, that probably helped yeah I I there was a time I, I just sort of as you were speaking thinking back that um, I was in America and I decided to wild camp on the side of a trail about half a mile outside the local village yeah and uh, anyway I it, because it was pitch black when I decided to camp I didn't realize but I just camped right next to a train track and in the morning a freight train comes past and before they get to each village they always sound the horn and I just happen to be at the right perfect oh, geez. place just just as they sound the horn so at five in the morning suddenly my head was just exploding <laughs> with this noise and I was like what is going on <laughs> <laughs> that would have woken you up with a start no doubt yeah, that certainly uh, got you out of your got me out of my bed very quickly. <laughs> yeah, I think it's a funny one because I feel like actually probably in America or something I'd probably be a bit more wary about like wild camping and stuff just because of like the animals. Like, be like you know, if you've got bears or snakes or you know, at least in Scotland, like you kind of worry about midges, not so bad. Yeah. Like once you're in your tent, uh, ticks. Ticks was probably the thing I was like most scared of actually because they're just gross. Um, yeah. Yeah. And so on that trip, uh, what was the sort of best part of it, did you find? Oh, <laughs> I mean, how long do you have? Um, I don't All know. the time it, in the world. <laughs> it's a funny one because it's kind of, I, I feel like I probably have a different answer every time I think about that question. Like it's kind of, you know, there's there's certain days that are definite highlights of certain hills, like um certain places which are just incredible that you know I wouldn't have visited before like I think kind of a lot of um like before I did Project 2 I hadn't really explored that much north of the Great Glen um so the Great Glen just being the fault line up from Fort William to Inverness um so I hadn't really visited like much like the proper like northern highlands um I think like the northwest of Scotland is just incredible like there's some amazing places and some places where like you literally feel like you could be the only person in the world. Like, you know, you kind of just like, it feels like really remote still. Um, I mean, but realistically, you know, you're never probably, you know, you're probably a day's walk from a road is probably the most you're ever going to get. Um, but yeah, I mean, so there's some like incredible places. So the likes of Noidart, um, which is like, it's known as the rough bounds of Noidart. And it's, yeah, it's, um, 
it is remote like you kind of you either get there on a boat or else you walk in or else you like there's a road that goes down that's like a 22 mile long single track road um like a dead end um so that's that was a pretty big highlight um like the fisher fields and like and shellac like up in yeah the far northwest they're like incredible hills um but i think it's it's also one of those things that it's kind of you know, like it's if the weather's good you're probably gonna be in a good frame of mind anyway if you've had a good night's sleep the night before you're probably going to be having a nice day uh if you bump into nice people on the hills who talk to you like you know that's like especially if you haven't seen anyone for a few days suddenly it's like, like i remember there was one place where i'd um it was a uh, storm hector had hit the uk so i'd had quite a tough few days and i basically was on like a kind of I'd planned to be away from my bike for five days and then I ended up being away for six days and I'd run out of gas on like the last morning so I couldn't make my porridge and I wasn't quite desperate enough to go for cold porridge um but then I like met these people just when I was maybe about 10k away from my bike and I'd so I'd been walking maybe 20k already that day but I hadn't really had any food just like a handful of nuts and that was about it and they gave me a Twix and it was the best thing ever. <laughs> it was literally like, you know, that's like a genuine highlight, but it's just a Twix. That, but, you know, it's kind of all the circumstances that add together to make it. Um, I think probably in terms of like, if I have to pick out like a single kind of like standout really good day, there was, um, I had an amazing day in Glencoe uh, when I did the Anarchy Cook. Um, and that was like kind of, I think, because it's, it's got quite a big reputation. Like it's... Um, it's two Munros, but it's like the ridge line that's I think it's the narrowest ridge on the UK mainland. Um and so yeah, it was um definitely like it was the last one that was kind of the like intimidating Munros that I had left. Um and I remember I kind of switched my days around because the day that I did it, like I wanted to do it in good weather and I just had like one good weather day whenever I was kind of around there and I was like, right, that's the day I did the Anarchy Cook. And yeah, just like everything kind of came together. I had like a lovely bike ride up to it and then did the ridge and then dropped down to the road. And then I went up the other side of the glen and did like the other two Monroes and got back to my bike and cycled down the road and got to the pub three minutes before last order. So it was just like, you know, everything just kind of came together to make a wonderful day. Um, But yeah, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I think there's, you know, just so many different, different days that had like, you know, genuine highlights. And I think sometimes you know, some days were really tough and really hard, but then they were maybe the days that actually now, whenever I look back on it, perhaps I enjoyed the most or actually maybe they're the ones that I feel like I got the most out of or, um, you know, kind of, I guess, learnt the most or that kind of thing. Like um, I had one day, like right in my last week, that um, it was another name, Storm, Storm Alley. I don't think I'll ever forget Storm Alley. And um, it was, yeah... It was the Wednesday and I was finishing on the Saturday and I still had like a lot of hills to go. Like I'd set myself like a real like tough push to the end. Um, And yeah, I just remember like it was rain was lashing down in the morning. Like we're staying in a like we'd stayed in a um, like got an apartment or like a little house like for a few days kind of based like around Loch Tay for a few days and was kind of like working out and back and basically I'd kind of given up camping by the end because the weather was just like awful and I was putting in like big day after big day and I just yeah didn't have any reserves left basically but yeah that day I remember saying how <laughs> just like looking out the window being like do I really have to go out in that and looking at the weather forecast being like this isn't a sensible day to go up a hill at all like you know it's kind of like you know weather warnings for wind and rain like um yeah I think kind of 100 mile an hour kind of winds like not not the day that you'd recommend to anyone to go out and also probably the only day on the whole thing that I was like I genuinely can't call for help today because I I can't put someone else in the position like I can't call for mountain rescue today and get a mountain rescue team to come out and like take me off a mountain on the day that I shouldn't have been out in the hills at all kind of thing so it was a yeah, it was a weird one. I definitely set off that day being like, I'm probably going to turn around in about five minutes. And actually, I, I made it up one Munro, but then I was meant to, like, my route was meant to go over to another Munro. And as soon as I kind of got onto the first Munro, I realised that the only reason I got up it was because the bulk of the mountain was shielding me from the worst of the weather. And once I got to the summit, I was like, I couldn't stand up, basically. It was like, right. Um, yeah, that was a very quick turnaround, go back down, get warm, get dry, three hot chocolates in front of a fire in a pub. That kind of fixed things up. But... Um, yeah. So on your, so you said sort of going up the ridge line 
and you could barely stand up. Would you say that was the most challenging part of the expedition or were there many days and <laughs> hours and nights? Um, yeah, I mean, I think in terms of kind of physicality, the kind of last week was like really tough. And uh, like the last kind of, yeah, basically, because after, after I turned around in Storm Alley, then I effectively like lost kind of, well, I was meant to, you know, my plan would have been to have done three Munros that day. And then it meant that I kind of had to wait and then start again the next morning. Um, and then basically, so that Thursday, Friday, Saturday, that last three days was just like, it felt like I was in like a solo adventure race just on my own against my own, like arbitrarily set deadlines and stuff. But the thing was basically for the last one, I had like, I needed like logistical help and stuff because the last one was um, Ben Lomond, which is the further south. And the way that I came at it, I was crossing Loch Lomond. So I had like friends who parked up at the Ben Lomond side and then came across in a canoe and some paddle boards and met me at the other side. And so my bike got then taken around and I like supped across. But um, well, I sat on my knees and paddled across because I was a bit too like much of a space cadet to even stand up at this point I think in my initially I thought I'd kind of like the idea of swimming across it but I just remember like I just kept looking at Loch Lomond when I was on like the hills kind of the two days before like every time I kind of got a glimpse of the lock I was just like it's so big and it looks so cold from here <laughs> um, and actually then my friends who came over they were like you're not swimming because you're just going to get hypothermic and you're going to um like have to end in an ambulance and not climb your last hill kind of thing was the even though I had a wetsuit it was still um but yeah I mean I basically the night before I had had I sat in my bivy bag for about an hour and a bit kind of just waiting for it to get light because I was just a bit scared basically um, which sounds a bit silly I was just scared of the dark um yeah no I think I was just like I, the night before I was getting you know I was so tired I was like hallucinating and stuff and I at one point thought that I, I was convinced I saw a crane and it was like there definitely wasn't a crane where I was and you know it's kind of like all sorts of random things and I was like oh but there's a crane and it's building a bothy and then I can go and stay in the bothy and then I'm like I'm gonna fall off like <laughs> I'm just gonna like fall over and like hurt myself or something you know it's kind of the next progression but um on, on this podcast we talk quite a lot about the sort of mindset of doing these adventures what sort of dro drives you when times are tough sort of being in horrendous situations and sort of pushing through what's the sort of drive in the back of your head that sort um, of persuades think, you to keep going rather than to quit yeah I mean I think it kind of depends like I guess kind of why you're doing it and what you're trying to achieve and stuff and I think I mean for me on that last night like by that point there was no question of me not finishing like you know I was just like everything was bent on getting to the finish line and you know I'd already spent like 119 days out in Scotland like you know what's one extra day and two extra hills or whatever it was by then um but I mean I actually the, I think probably the the point that I was like most likely to quit was um it was in Glen Etive, so just just down from Glencoe, like where, where Skyfall was filmed, um, if you're a James Bond fan. Um, but I'd had, I think it was like three days in a row that it had just been raining the whole time. And I'd been in my tent the whole time. And I was just like, I think that was basically the point that I gave up camping, actually, I think, was then. Um, and started being like, oh, credit cards are very useful. Um, but it... Um, yeah, I think that day I've got a video that I did in the morning that I was just, you know, talking to talking to the camera and kind of just being like, yeah, I've got to put on all my wet stuff again and go out in the rain again. And I was getting more and more miserable. And then I just suddenly just burst into tears. And I was just like, oh, I wish I was like inside and stuff. Um, and I think genuinely that day, if, if there had been someone there with a car being like, you can just get in the car and be done now and be finished, I probably would have been like, yeah, sure, I'll take you up on that. But as it was, where I was, it was like, well... I'm 20 miles from the closest train station. Uh, I've got all my stuff with me. I'm going to have to just pack up my bike anyway and get on my bike and get going. And, and you know, as it turned out, once I packed up the bike, then it stopped raining as much. I dried off when I was cycling across Rannockmore. And then I actually, yeah, I checked into a hotel, like, and hung up all my stuff to dry in my room and then went out and got on my bike again and climbed some more hills and came back and had a good feed. And, you know, it was a lot better <laughs> by that point. Um, I think it's just kind of like sometimes just kind of that, like, recognition that, yeah, you might be struggling at the time or it might be tough or you're suffering or whatever, but it's the kind of like, well, that's not going to, it's not going to be that state forever. You know, it's kind of like, well, yeah, this, this is going to pass. And, and then it will get better again. And once I've gone through this bit that, yeah, this bit's a bit crap and 
I'm not enjoying it. But once I've gone through it, I'll probably look back on it and be like, yeah, I'm glad I did that. And I'm glad that I overcame it. And um, yeah, so I think I definitely like play like mind games with myself whenever I'm in like what I'm finding challenging situations. You know, I'm kind of like there being like, I'll definitely do the, I'll tell myself that something's not as bad as something else that I've done before. Or like, you know, kind of just be like, um, yeah, just kind of come up with little like, oh, if I just like do this little bit now, then that's like, I think kind of breaking things down really helps, like bite-sized chunks. Um, and I know definitely at the start of Project 202, I was terrified. Like I didn't know how long it was going to take. I it was just like, I mean, I kind of, oh, it's quite funny. I actually looked at the spreadsheet I made the other day, like as my kind of planning spreadsheet. And I was like, I wasted so much time doing that because I had no idea how long it was going to take. I didn't know how I was going to like condition into it. I like, was literally just like looking at places on the map being like, yeah, maybe I'll camp there. It's like, um, but yeah, and I was definitely, you know, at the start, it was kind of like, oh my goodness, 282 Munros, that's a lot. And even when I was, you know, 50 Munros in or something, I was like, I've still got 232 to go. Like, you know, it kind of, yeah, like it's just easier to be like okay well today I'm just going to go out and I'm going to climb these ones and oh this stint I'll leave my bike here and I'll go and do this loop and I'll like you know so I was kind of like breaking it down into like lots of mini mini expeditions I guess and like mini hill days and yeah Take, taking each day as it comes rather exactly than and then being like oh there's a f- four month trek yeah exactly and you know especially if I was going somewhere that there's like say there was a pub or something it's like oh maybe I can get a sticky toffee pudding tonight you know that helps oh so sticky toffee pudding was the big motivator, the big drive to get you through each day. I was actually on a sticky toffee pudding tour of Scotland. I just had to climb some hills to justify the calories of the sticky toffee puddings. I was like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you just had to pretend like it was something serious, but actually all it really was was a searching for the number one sticky toffee pudding. Exactly. Yeah. Where where whereabouts did you find it? Oh, see. I think I've got two like two strong contenders. There was one in Glenfinnan, um, which is where the like the Harry Potter train goes over the viaduct. Um, there's a really nice hotel uh, on Loch Shield there. They do a really good sticky toffee pudding. Um, but there was also one in Braemar, which was excellent. And I sampled that twice on the trip because I had it once on my way into the Cairngorms and once on my way back out as well. And they were really lovely in the hotel. So I feel like maybe it's kind of because the people were so nice, it maybe slightly pips the sticky toffee pudding. And yeah, I think, I think that gets my number one. The, the atmosphere and experience really exactly brought it exactly. all together. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> nice. And so what's, um, what's your plan next? Is uh, have you got another adventure lined up, or are you very much sort of playing it by ear? Um, yeah, I mean, I think I've kind of got a few ideas and stuff, um, but yeah, at the moment, I, I don't know. I mean, I guess like everyone, it's pretty hard to plan anything right now, isn't it? It's uh, yeah, it's just kind of trying to trying to work out what works, and I mean, at the moment, I'm slightly trying to focus on. Uh, getting a little bit of money together ideally well more trying to pay off my credit card a bit more before I can uh, rack it up again um which yeah is a bit I don't know slightly like always makes me a bit like like I don't know <laughs> um, but it's yeah necessary isn't it like um yeah I mean I think I quite like I really enjoy like adventures that don't necessarily have to cost that much and especially kind of once you you know like I've got a bike and I've got like most of the kit I need and stuff but it's kind of still you know obviously there's logistics involved and um and then obviously if you're away on like for a few months or whatever that's a few months that you're probably not earning otherwise um so yeah it's kind of I don't know I'm not really answering your question (laughs) you are um I mean yeah I've got I've got ideas like I've got things that I want to do but I think at the moment I slightly feel like I'm probably looking at more kind of smaller like maybe like things that are like a week or something and trying to do like I did um I actually whenever I came back from the Alps this summer I came back to Scotland at the end of August and we had to self-isolate for two weeks and I think it took me four days into self-isolation before I was like right I've just booked my bike and myself a ticket on the train to Penzance and I'm going to cycle Lands End to John O'Groats and that was just like yeah um that gave me something to kind of aim towards for after quarantine um and yeah I do slightly feel like at the moment I'm kind of searching for something to kind of focus on as like a as a goal or an objective but perhaps not like a kind of 
big thing. I don't know. I mean, there's, yeah, I mean, there, there's more hills in, in the UK that I'd definitely like to climb. Um, but whether or not, like, I feel the need to kind of do it in the same way that I did the Munros is, um, yeah, I don't know. And I'm, I don't know. I, I keep going back up Munros as well. It's, it's actually really nice having climbed them before. It's kind of like, I've got no kind of like, oh, I can't go up that hill because I've done it before or anything. Like it's kind of just like, oh, I can do any of them and I don't really mind because I've been up them before. But each hill day is different anyway because, you know, it's like the weather's different, the people you're with is different. And um, yeah, I don't know. I'm actually, I've got like kind of a list of hills that I really didn't enjoy whenever I was doing 282 that they're kind of the ones that I'm like, waiting for good weather days and then being like, I really want to go back up there and see what it actually looks like whenever you're not in sideways rain all day. <laughs> Well, I suppose being in Edinburgh, you've got Salisbury Crags, Arthur Seat. Indeed, indeed. Pop up there. Pentlands. I was at, I was actually up in the Pentlands last night, although the like the fog was really in, and I had my head torch with me. And you know, whenever you're driving and you're like, like your headlights just bounce off the fog, I was basically like that. So I ended up my my run turned into a hike. So, um, but it was still nice, even though it was dark. Couldn't really see. <laughs> and if you have too much uh, withdrawal symptoms of your skiing, you can always go on the dry ski, ski slope there. Yep. <laughs> yeah, I haven't quite resorted to that yet. <laughs> I, uh, in my, because I, I lived in Edinburgh for five years, I, I never did either. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's, I mean to be fair, as far as the dry slope goes, it is, um, it is the best one there is. But um, yeah, it's not quite Zermatt. So um, there's a part of the show which we ask the get each guest the same question each week. Um, the first being, what's the one bizarre thing that you crave or miss from home when you're out doing these adventures? Well, any kind of challenges or adventures that I do tend to be quite um, not that extreme. Like, you know, not really like, you know, in Scotland, like you can get to a shop, like you can kind of, you know, you can get your British, your British snacks and stuff. Um so I guess maybe kind of more like home comforts in a sense that, you know, sometimes it's just so nice to just like put on like a pair of like comfy pajamas and actually that was whenever I finished the Monroe's I actually like specifically went to like Marks and Spencer and treated myself to some nice pajamas whenever I got back <laughs> so I could just like loll around in pajamas all day um yeah I do it <laughs> that's that's good um did you have a favorite adventure book growing up um probably not a favorite book like I mean I read I read quite a lot in general uh, I read quite a lot of adventure books um my kind of I think my kind of favorite ones like if you kind of look back at the books I've read over the years and really enjoyed I definitely really enjoy reading about like the South Pole and reading about Everest I don't know why I think partly probably because I'm actually really bad at dealing with the cold so there's part of me that's like I just don't think I could ever do that because I think I'd like if I tried to go to like Antarctica I'd like come back with the four fingers less or something um so I think there's definitely kind of a an element of kind of like armchair adventuring going on there um yeah um I think kind of some standout ones that I've like enjoyed kind of recently probably um like Chris Bonington's Ascent like that was a really like really enjoyed that book um like ran off finds like Mad Bad and Dangerous to Know that was um a really good one um yeah I actually um uh yeah like I mean I don't know I I kind of just tend to like yeah read so ready I, I read one actually that's like a bit different but um the other day I was reading one about uh a man like back in like the 70s who rode a horse across the whole of the US um which was like a really like different kind of adventure like went like coast to coast in the US um yeah so I guess that's not cold places necessarily but it was good um nice did you have an inspirational figure growing up um I mean, <laughs> I don't know. I think there's like, I can find like inspiration in a lot of things. Um, yeah, and I think, I mean, yeah, just kind of, I guess, kind of looking at you kind of more like, like proper explorers of the day, you know, the like Shackleton and Scott, like that era of the Antarctic. Like, I think that was like amazing and stuff. Um, I mean, I think kind of like nowadays you probably can, it's really easy to go on like social media and just like 
like you look up a hashtag for like adventure or explore or something and actually like you can find so much stuff there's so much cool stuff that so many people like do um yeah I mean I definitely find sometimes it's easy to just like you know you find yourself like scrolling on Instagram and then being like oh wow that looks awesome or like oh my god that person did this that's so cool or like you know it's kind of um yeah nice uh what about a favorite quote favorite quote <sighs> or motivational quote <laughs> I mean this is maybe a bit corny but one that's just like just jumped out and I don't even know who said it but it's um I think I like read it on like a shop window at some point but it's like life's not about waiting for the storm to pass it's about learning to dance in the rain so I, that, I don't that know who was, said it that was actually one of my sister's favorite quotes yeah um yeah she she it's a very I think it's a very good quote because it's very easy to sort of sit back and just sort of think things will get better. And actually, um, yeah, it's, I think it's a really good one. And actually, like, even if you take it in a like literal sense, sometimes it's really fun dancing in the rain. Like, exactly. I mean, I definitely find like, you know, when it's, if it's raining and grim outside, sometimes you're like, don't want to go outside. But actually, once you get out, it's generally not as bad as you think it's going to be. And actually, you can have quite a nice time. And I think, you know, you can take that literally or metaphorically as well. Like, you know, it's just kind of, you can... Yeah, like you've got to kind of take take the positives where you can, really. Being in Scotland, you have so many opportunities. <laughs> um, so people listening are always keen to go traveling and go on these adventures. What's the one thing that you would recommend for them to get them started? I think sometimes just kind of like biting the bullet and just like doing something to make it happen. Like, so... When I recently cycled Land's End John O'Groats, I booked my train ticket and then I like made my plan and worked out how I was going to actually do it. But I think, you know, once I like booked the train ticket, I'd like made a commitment, I'd parted with some money and then it was like, right, it's happening. Um, I mean, when I did Project 2 at 2, I think kind of the key thing was I told, um, I told some of my friends, in fact, the guys who I did the adventure race in Wales with, I told them that I was like thinking about doing this, like, oh, I might go and do the Munros and like, be like self-propelled in between them and then I think kind of once I told them that was my like point that I was like yeah I'm, I'm doing this and I know that by telling them I'm basically making myself accountable and I know that they're going to be like so how's the planning going are you going to do it like um so I think yeah sometimes I guess just kind of like stating that you're going to do it like you know and if you kind of say it publicly or something then maybe it makes it happen and maybe that was why I, why I was being a bit lame with my answer about what's next because maybe I'm a bit like oh no if I if I say I'm going to do something then I'm going to have to go and do it um it's holding you yeah. to account yeah and I think I think sometimes it's kind of you can get really easily put off by being like oh no I don't I don't have the the skills to do that or I don't have the finances to do that or the equipment to do that and I think so sometimes like maybe just kind of like think right okay what do you have the skills for or what do you have the equipment for or like you know like you don't have to go on like an expedition to Everest like you know you can start a lot closer to home and you know not have to you know I think there's there's certain things that I know I'd like love to do but I'm just like I don't even know where I would start about kind of like like yeah like fundraising for it or like you know and these kind of like bigger like expeditions you know I think that's definitely like the kind of financial side is obviously a massive barrier that kind of deters people and stuff. I suppose for me, actually having a bike and just a couple of panniers makes an enormous difference because you can just shove anything in two panniers, whether it's your, well, anything really, a uh, sleeping bag, pillow, and then you've got the freedom just to cycle wherever you want to go. And you can cover so much distance. So, you know, you can get from the south, one, north of England to the south of England in a week just cycling and you can wild camp or you can credit card tour whatever you want but just the and that's not going to cost you an arm or a leg and actually just doing these little ones whatever your budget is you can easily adapt it yeah There's sort of no excuse not 100 percent, exactly and i think i think as well like one of the things i've probably learned is that you never really need as much as you think you need as well like and you know you kind of like I'm a big fan of dry bags um so if you basically got like a dry set of clothes in a dry bag and like your sleeping bag and stuff in a dry bag and then whatever you're wearing then actually you don't really need much more beyond that um so actually you know it's kind of and certainly if you're trying to do like longer distance stuff where you're like 
if you're cycling or if you're hiking or whatever, the lighter your bag is, the more you'll <laughs> appreciate it. Like when I was doing the Monroe's, I sent, I like probably spent quite a lot of money on postage because um, I was like, nope, don't need this, don't need that. Like posting things home, like kind of every time I got to a post office, really. Um, and Emily, how can uh, people find you? Uh, probably Instagram's probably the easiest normally, at Adventure Scotty. Um, <laughs> yeah um also like i'm involved with um the british adventure collective so that's at british adventure collective and also the website is britishadventurecollective.com and we're trying to like put together some some trips and stuff to bring people on like on adventures um going forwards is that um yeah so kind of just like some like weekend like adventure weekend experiences and stuff that we're working on at the moment <laughs>